Howdy, and welcome to a patron-only bonus episode of Wise About Texas. This is your host, Ken Wise, and let me tell you, I really appreciate you supporting this show. It does take some money and a tremendous amount of time to research and write and produce this show, and I certainly appreciate your willingness to support the show. In the main episode, this uh, episode about John James Audubon, I mentioned the new customs house in Galveston that was completed in 1837. It stood where Sanger Fest Park is now, at the corner of Strand and Tremont Street in the heart of downtown Galveston. Two days after the keys were turned over to that new building, it was washed away in a hurricane. Well, it turns out that the hurricane was a fairly famous storm, and I wanted to fill you in on it, especially since it's mid-August 2016, and we're approaching the critical part of hurricane season in the Gulf. I'll also say... Uh, A little bonus content about a hurricane is appropriate because my next episode will cover a slightly more famous storm. And that's a hint, if you couldn't tell. The August 30, or excuse me, the 1837 storm was spawned in the Windward Islands, as so many hurricanes are. In fact, I'm releasing this bonus episode to y'all on August 18th, 2016. And just yesterday, we had a tropical storm pop up in the same area. In late September 1837, the storm hit Haiti, Jamaica, and Cuba. The storm then moved west and hit the Yucatan Peninsula. The storm then moved up the Mexican coast to the mouth of the Rio Grande and flooded the area, including Matamoros. After that, it continued up the Texas coast, which is not the normal path we've seen storms take in our lifetimes. There must have been some sort of high pressure in the interior of Texas that kept it on the coast. Along the way from the Caribbean to the Yucatan, the hurricane passed over a British ship called the Racer, which survived the storm and and gave an account of the storm. And that's why this great hurricane has since been known as Racer Storm. Now, the hurricane season of 1837 was a bad one for the Caribbean islands anyway. Barbados had had two huge hurricanes in 1837 before Racer Storm. It also had an earthquake. All the ships in port at Barbados were destroyed, but that's not all. The earthquake also ruptured undersea pockets of natural gas, sulfur, and most importantly, hydrogen sulfide gas. And if you look at accounts of the time, they talk about rotten egg smells. They talk about the plants turning different colors. Silver coins would turn black. The paint on the buildings would turn strange colors. And, uh, of course, there were huge fish kills. And interestingly, when Racer Storm flooded Matamoros, Jean-Louis Berlandier was in Matamoros. He was a naturalist, just like John James Audubon. And he had traveled through Texas before Audubon in the 1827-1829 time period and settled in Matamoros. And since he was a scientist, he became the weatherman in Matamoros. When he heard Racer Storm approaching, what he described was that the surf began to pound and he actually thought it was artillery being fired. And that's interesting because Galveston weatherman Isaac Klein's first clue that something strange was going on in Galveston in 1900 was the same sort of sound. So there's your next hint for the next episode. Well, from October the 1st through October the 4th in Matamoros, there was almost 40 inches of rain. Now, that's a heck of a storm. And when Matamoros was flooding, while Matamoros was flooding, Galveston was already getting some rain. So that storm was huge. Several ships on the Rio Grande were washed up onto the shore a considerable distance. The Texan ship Velasco was due in Galveston in late September of 1837, but ended up caught in the storm. Her mainmast was destroyed. Uh, The ship was pounded against the Mexican shore and finally limped into Galveston. So a trip that it was scheduled to take from New Orleans to Galveston for five days turned into about a month-long odyssey, and half of her passengers and crew lost their lives. In other words, the entire Texas coast was affected by the storm at one time. Uh, But the storm, the eye of the storm, must have stayed just offshore because there are not many accounts of destructive wind very far inland, mostly some rain. And some descriptions talk about rain squalls, which probably were the outer bands of the hurricane. And the storm, what the storm was actually doing was following the Texas coastline, curving up to the northeast. The wind started getting serious in Galveston over the October 6th to the 8th time period, and the fact that the wind lasted so long was an indication that the storm was hovering sort of offshore. On October the 6th, the wind uh, shifted to the northeast, which as we all know means that it was starting to come inland. Now, I mentioned Colonel Amasa Turner in the main episode. He had recently arrived to take over command of the Texan post at Galveston, and he wrote that there were about 25 ships in the Galveston Harbor 
and amazingly, only three were total losses, although all of them were affected. Now, the other main building in Galveston at the time was a huge warehouse that was just completed by the businessmen Samuel May Williams and Thomas McKinney. Two ships, the Jane and the Henry, were carried into the warehouse, and the warehouse was totally demolished. The beaches and the sandbars in the bay were totally reconfigured by Racer Storm. And now, Turner had moved from his Casa Grande that I described in the main episode into the old Mexican Customs House since the new Customs House had just been delivered. And during the storm, there were over 100 people in Turner's house since it was one of the few buildings in town. Now, another group of people had just arrived in Galveston on a ship called the LB from Connecticut. The Allen Brothers up in Houston had hired them to come start a steam mill on the north side of Buffalo Bayou, about where U of H downtown is now. And they were on the ship when the storm hit. The ship got washed onto a sandbar and was starting to break up. The first mate deserted, probably dead. The rest of the crew cut the masts off, cut the rigging, and the ship was lifted off the bar and driven a full three-quarters of a mile onto the shore. Uh, And there were 12 other ships with it, three-quarters of a mile onto the shore. Another account of that racer storm in Galveston described flooding 15 to 20 miles onto the prairie. Now, it's hard to imagine what it looked like around the bay back then, but there was really nothing between Galveston and Morgan's Point. The the flooding could have gone further than was described. There just wasn't anybody there to see it. Now, here's a very interesting part. A lady from Houston at the time wrote that Houston had no storm and no news of a storm in Galveston. And she had arrived in Galveston shortly after the storm hit, and she was totally surprised that there was any destruction. Now, that sounds strange to us, but if you think about it, back then, 50 miles from Houston to Galveston was a long trip. You would have had to have taken a boat from what's now basically Commerce Street and Main Street in downtown Houston all the way down Buffalo Bayou into the San Jacinto River and across Galveston Bay. So that was a several-day journey. And to 1837 people, that was a real excursion. Now, there are some accounts about Buffalo Bayou being three or four feet higher because of the storm surge. Those were accounts from Houston. Now, there's a reference point for us in modern day as to how big this storm really was. Our most recent hurricane, Hurricane Ike, in 2008, had a huge storm surge, but downtown Houston really wasn't affected. The 1837 account would have been describing water levels as higher in Buffalo Bayou right in the middle of downtown, of present-day downtown Houston because that's where the town was. So that was a tremendous storm surge. Uh, Well, Racer Storm went on into Louisiana just below St. Martinsville, It caused a lot of destruction in Baton Rouge and what was described as mountain high waves on Lake Pontchartrain. It hammered the Mississippi coast and the Alabama coast before moving east and out over Cape Hatteras and into the Atlantic. Uh, One story out of Cape Hatteras was that there was a ship, um, and on the ship was a a steamship. It was a 75-year-old woman. And the steamship was broken to pieces on the reefs, and she but she survived the storm. The couch she was sitting on was washed ashore on the waves, and she rode it all the way to the shore and lived. So she was one of early America's first literal couch surfers. Well, we'll never know if Racer Storm was the most powerful hurricane, but it was the most powerful anyone had seen up until that time. And it took a very unusual 4,100-mile trip across the Gulf and up the coast from the Yucatan all the way out through North Carolina. Now, the only positive thing to result from the storm was that after the storm and because of the destruction, the U.S. Congress passed a law requiring every vessel to have a life preserver for every passenger, and that law continues to this day. Well, that wraps up this bonus episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you very, very much for supporting the show. I hope you'll encourage your friends to do the same. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.